you all probably remember Dr. Mako and Dr. Kellner, uh, since both of them presented at the the um, last vascular presentation. Um, but uh, just to very quickly reintroduce them, Dr. Mako is our residency program director and uh, director of the Cerebrovascular Center, trained uh, primarily at Columbia and did his endovascular fellowship up in Buffalo. And Dr. Kellner um, is another one of the cerebrovascular faculty, um, open and endovascular neurosurgeon, uh, who also trained at Columbia and uh, did his fellowship here at Mount Sinai before joining the faculty. And we are fortunate to also be joined tonight by Dr. Fifi, who has also has more than a decade of experience in endovascular interventions for um, in, in neurosurgery. She trained in neurology uh, at Jefferson, followed by a number of illustrious fellowships um, at NIH, WashU, um, and Columbia uh, before joining us here. She also spent some time with Dr. Berenstain uh, and is now one of his colleagues. So I'm gonna hand it over to them. Uh, for those of you who are applying to US residencies this year, uh, go ahead and raise your hands. I'll make you panelists. And uh, looking forward to another great session. Awesome, thank you so much, Peter. I'm gonna start off and we're gonna do a case each. And then two of us are gonna do two cases. <clears throat> Excuse me. So let's start with this case. Chris, could I interrupt real quick? Please. Where do we, Peter, where do we see the like list of people? Oh, there it is. You're filling it up now. Okay. Yeah. Got it. Sorry, go ahead. So this is a, let me uh, move it around so I can see it. Great. A 56 year old male who develops difficulty speaking while at lunch with his family. In the ER, one hour after symptom onset, he has lethargy, right-sided weakness, global aphasia, and his stroke scale was evaluated at 16. <clears throat> Let's see what I've got here. Lewis, do you see any findings on this CT that was done immediately when he arrived? Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. So I see some changes. Um, Bilara on the frontal area um, could be block or could be a uh, loss of great matter. Okay. Did you see it on any particular side? Um, I feel <clears throat> it's, it's larger on on the left side. Okay. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> I think that I'm showing this to highlight that it is very challenging on an initial CT in a patient with stroke symptoms to identify asymmetry. And there's a lot of debate often. <clears throat> and we do have a score that we use to identify that. So often you'll use the symptoms and the sidedness from the symptoms to tell you what's going on. But sometimes the CT is normal in an acute stroke patient who has severe symptoms. And so this one, maybe you could identify some loss of gray white right here, but also <clears throat> sometimes just white matter disease can look hypo, hyper dense a little bit. So <clears throat> I would say that possibly this is normal or possibly I'm seeing a little bit of hypo density here, but the patient having left brain symptoms would lead me to look over here and look over here. And then I would say either it's normal or there's a little bit there. And the importance is gonna be in the CTA. <clears throat> and so what do you see in the CTA? So in the CTA on the left side, I see an axial cut where I am not sure if I see on on the right side, um, it is a bone or is it, is it an artifact that is yeah. crossing over the... Um... You got it. So these are, this is volume averaged. And mm -hmm. so you'll often see vessels come in and out of plane. Mm -hmm. This is a CTA. And on this CTA, you can see an occlusion here and it would require scrolling up and down to confirm that it's an actual occlusion. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and you can kind of see maybe illumination of something right here with some contrast is getting a little bit of contrast is getting through. Mm -hmm. but there's definitely fewer, there are fewer vessels here. And you see the same thing here on the left side. And we do expect to see yeah. occlusion there from the symptoms. So there is a left, a left M1 occlusion here. And we bring this patient to the angiography suite. And we also see 
that he has an occlusion in the carotid artery. Here's the common carotid artery. Here's the external. And I know it's the external because I start to see branches coming off it. And then the internal, I see a lot of calcium here. Mm -hmm. And then I don't see the internal uh, carotid artery. So we were able to see the CTA before going to the operating room for a thrombectomy. <clears throat> so I knew what I was getting into and came in ready to stent if necessary. Can I ask a question? Do we always do um, uh, TPA before doing a thrombectomy? It looks like Chris is frozen. Well, I'll answer that. Uh, I don't know who asked while Chris is coming back. Can you guys hear me? Yeah. Okay. So um, the, the short answer is yes. Uh, that's current recommended standards. Uh, it's been something that we've pushed for for a long time in the community. Uh, it comes down to a basic solution of it's much easier to get somewhere if you know where you're going on the way, right? If you're going to drive somewhere, you want a map to know what's happening. And interestingly, there was a big study called IMS3 that uh, was published and was by quotes negative for the benefit of thrombectomy back in published in 2013. Uh, but if you looked at that study, there were a couple interesting findings. That study had originally blocked the performance of a CTA prior to thrombectomy because they felt it would increase the time to treatment too much. But when you looked at the places, because the standard of care had moved to where many people felt it was necessary, so there were many people who did it anyways. And if you looked at the centers that did the CTA versus the centers that didn't, they actually were getting treatment times that were quicker than the ones that didn't. That was issue number one. Issue number two, in that study, which was a, a many hundreds of patients prospective randomized trial, uh, even though it originally forbid CTA and then because so many people were doing it and they weren't enrolling, they then allowed CTA to be done. And they pre-specified ahead of time that they would also look at the patients that had CTAs before randomization to see if that showed a signal in the outcome. And even though the abstract and the newspaper headlines that came out in the New England Journal and the front of the Washington Post all said thrombectomy failed, it wasn't worthwhile. If you looked at the pre-specified subgroup of patients who had CTAs ahead of time, it was significantly beneficial. And that patient population actually showed benefit. Pretty, pretty interesting, right? Another interesting side point, well, why did the other patients not show benefit? Well, it turns out around, not quite, but almost 20% of the patients that went to treatment didn't have occlusion. Because if you don't see a CTA, it's hard to know, does the patient really have a large vessel occlusion or do they just have a lacunar stroke that's taking out their internal capsule? So they're completely plegic, but they don't actually have something you can treat. So interesting, you know, sort of points. Uh, it's completely reasonable if you could do it in a timely fashion to get an MRA. Uh, but the reality of MR is that many of these patients can't speak. You don't have histories, so you can't put them in an MR. So your workflow is always slower uh, with MRA for the most part. I'm sure if this is recorded, someone will take offense at what I just said, but it's fundamentally true. And, uh, and so you take the patient for a CT, you get a CTA. If you do it at the same time while they're still on the table, uh, it adds a matter of three to six or seven minutes to get that additional study as long as you have access. Uh, and it's definitely the standard at the vast majority of centers across the country. And if the That's patient is not at risk for bleeding, then you would always do TPA prior to um, the thrombectomy as well? Well, that's an interesting question. Uh, the, the basic answer is yes. Um, as soon as the plain head CT is done and it shows no bleeding, if the patient is otherwise appropriate for TPA, then you should start mixing that TPA while the CTA is being done so that in the three to five minutes it takes you to mix the TPA, the CTA is done and you can pull the patient down and give them the medicine right there in the CT suite. You should give it right there. Um, that said, there was recently a trial published that argued that there was no benefit in the patient population to giving that TPA before. It is far from conclusive. And this is still a hotly debated topic that probably won't be solved for a while. Uh, my personal feeling is that you should 
give TPA in appropriate patients uh, if they're eligible and then proceed to thrombectomy as soon as you can. Yeah. Does that answer that? I just wanted to add that it's, I don't know if, if you meant the, the way um, that you phrase it, if you always give it. So the inclusion criteria for TPA is different than for thrombectomy. So TPA is only given up to about four and a half hours. Um, and uh, we do thrombectomy you know, now up to 24 hours, sometimes in rare cases in special circumstances beyond that. So for patients that are within the four and a half hour window that meet all of the inclusion exclusion criteria for TPA, right now, right now we do give it for those patients. Um, obviously anyone beyond that between four and a half and 24 hours, they're not a candidate for TPA, so we don't even consider that before going for thrombectomy. Thank you so much. So, Joanna, can we actually um, go to your case because Chris is having a total computer disaster that he is correct, currently correcting. Oh, okay. <laughs> we'll come back to his case. Let me... Uh... Yeah, let me see if I can bring it up. I should be able to. Actually, I have... Share screen. Does that work? Perfect. Yep. Okay. Well, it's not case number seven, but um, seems like case number one right now or two. <laughs> um, so this is a. Uh, uh, a 61 year old man who began experiencing a strange smell. Um, and so, because of that, um, I, it, this is kind of a uh, I don't know if you guys have been, I haven't been doing this, but have you guys been calling on people for asking what, what a strange smell might indicate to someone? Yeah, yeah. especially a neurologist. Uh, Not everyone does, Joanna, but the vascular guys do. So uh, okay, I'm okay. <laughs> well, the only person I can see is Ryan. <laughs> um, but yeah, a new onset of a episodic strange smell. What would what would that have you thinking? Um, strange sense of smell could be a sign of a temporal lobe focal seizure. Um, mm -hmm. That's one consideration. Um, if it's um, anosmia and you can't smell it all, it could be something with the olfactory brew, like a sphenoid wing meningioma, something structural like that. Okay, yeah, that's that's uh, exactly what um, everyone was thinking when they decided to get an MRI. Um, this happened to apparently be completely unrelated, but so the when he got the MRI, which uh, one slice of it is shown here, we see. Um, this uh, dark squiggle um, and, uh, and uh, you know, very suspicious for a vascular structure um, that's enlarged. So with this um, patient went for uh, angiography. Let me see. Uh, well, first MRA, that was an MRI. Um, the MRA was done, uh, I believe, right after the MRI and uh, on here, what you can see um, on the uh, reconstructed images, you can see the carotids, uh, the vertebrals, the basilar artery, and this uh, large vessel over here, which is very asymmetric, right? On the other side, very small. On this side, very large. That's the um, external carotid artery. Um, and then you see this... Uh, large uh, network here um, and and uh, you know you could begin to imagine that 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 vein that we you know what that vascular structure we saw is a vein that's that's uh, showing up right here um, so what what do you think this would be suspicious for who are you asking Joe uh, I guess I'll stick with Ryan since I can see him. <laughs> um, so if there are 
anastomoses, um, you said between the external carotid circulation and internal carotid circulation. Um, I mean, there could well, not be- not necessarily, not necessarily the internal carotid circulation. Um, you, you see the external enlarge a, uh, a network and then a vein. Um, I think um, ischemia um, in this carotid circulation, which leads to collateral formation, perhaps. That's a that's a good thought. It can that can happen. Uh, maybe not. Maybe not to this extent. The the external being this large. Um, mm -hmm. When you see the the vessels this large and a vein showing up on the uh, on the MRA, you, you think of shunting, so arteriovenous shunting, uh, a, dir an, a direct connection and anastomosis between the artery and the vein. Um, and so this is suspicious for an arteriovenous uh, fistula. Um, and, uh, and when we see that, um, and it's draining into uh, a suspicious vein like this in the middle of the brain, we, the next step is to do an angiogram, essentially. Um, and this is uh, the angiogram. It's a little bit... I'm just going to stop it for a second. And this is a little bit of a... a uh, maybe a little bit of a difficult case, but um, the... This is the internal carotid artery, the external carotid artery branches coming up. Um, the external carotid artery uh, has a, a branch that goes, that pierces um, the, the skull and enters and supplies the, uh, the lining of the brain, the dura. Um, do you know what that artery is called? Let's give, let's give someone else a chat. How about Sean, sure. Can you Sean Lyon or Sean Lynn? You on there? How do I say that, Sean? Yeah, it's, it's uh, Sean Lyon. Sean Lyon? All right, Sean. What, do you, what artery pierces the skull and feeds the uh, sac that covers the brain there? Uh, so, the, sorry, it feeds the, like, the dura. Is that what you're asking me? There we go. Mm -hmm. Look at that. Uh, Half just the middle of artery on that side. There we go. Yep, so that's the, the middle meningeal artery. So what well, we see, a very enlarged middle meningeal artery coming in. Again, this network and a vein coming out. Um, and you could see that this vein, you could see it better a little bit later. This is a not a few, but yeah. I'm just going to try to go through it a little slowly. I think you can click on the bar, Joe. Yeah, if I can drag it. Okay, here we go. Yeah, so there's the, the artery, the minimal meningeal fills first, and then this network comes, and then you immediately begin to see this structure here, which is a vein, and then the, the dye washes through, it washes out of the arteries, and then you're left with it in the small uh, arteries and capillaries, and you can see the vein much more clearly. Um, And so this is, I don't want to, this is a little bit of a, a difficult anatomical, um, a little bit difficult anatomical case, but it's, it's a vein that's leading into the basal vein of Rosenthal. Um, and this is what we call a dural arteriovenous malformation. And so the, uh, you know, the dural arteriovenous malformations um, I don't, I think Dr. Kellner asked me to, to present this. It may be a little bit uh, uh, higher level to ask um, the, the classification of those, but basically they're classified by where they connect to the dura and which dural 
uh, veins they connect to. If they connect to the big sinuses, those are considered safer. So this is not this is not the case. But if they're connecting to the superior sagittal sinus, uh, transverse sinus, those are considered safe, less likely to bleed. When they connect directly to cortical veins, like we see here, um, and drain backwards, or they drain backwards into cortical veins, that's when you have a risk of hemorrhage. And so in those cases, uh, the treatment is to close the abnormal connection. And this shows the catheter that we place uh, inside the minimal meningeal artery. Not starting automatically for some reason. There we go. And uh, no, you went backwards again somehow. I'm just waiting for it. It's not going, Joe. No. It's going on my screen. Yeah, we see it now. Now it's going. Struggling there you go, with the connection tonight. Yeah, the internet is not acting nicely, but so again, uh, you could see this connection. We'll just try to stop it um, here. And uh, this is the middle meningeal artery and this network coming directly from the artery to the vein. And so that's the abnormal point right here, the leading to a uh, hemorrhage. So to treat this, uh, we go into the feeding artery that connects directly to the vein. And this is an injection of a material called onyx, um, which we use to fill penetrate from the arterial side into the vein and fill the vein and therefore close the connection. Um, as you remember, there were multiple little connections. This is filling of one connection. And then we see that after the top part is filled, you can kind of see the onyx is sitting here and this top part is filled. We see that there's another bottom connect, there's another connection down here. So going back in uh, to that spot and filling the rest of it up with the onyx from another feeder. And this time making sure to get the entire, as far as is safe into the vein to fill up the vein and therefore stop the, uh, the, uh, the shunting. Um, that is the picture of the onyx after it's placed. Um, and that's a, the angiogram um, after the treatment. And you can see that where that vein was filling early, it's no longer filling early. I'll just let it play one more time. The external carotid is filling and there's nothing going backwards to the ba basal vein of Rosenthal. Um, and then this is just showing pre um, and post. It's a little bit actually messed up here, but I'm just going to take these out. This is just showing pre and post this connection uh, to the uh, to the basal veins and Rosenthal here, and then the onyx you can see in place, and that that uh, fistula is now gone. Um, so, does anyone have any questions about dural arterial venous fistulas? Yeah, I'm, I'm curious under what circumstances, hi, my name is Joe, thank you guys for putting this on. Um, I'm curious under what circumstances you would take this patient to the OR versus going uh, endovascularly. Joe, you want to take that or you want me to? Nowadays. I'll just uh, 
uh, you can hear me clearly. In most circumstances nowadays, we try to treat endovascular relief first. Um, you know, different people may have different thresholds for that. Uh, this is a relatively straightforward uh, procedure endovascularly, and I think uh, Dr. Mako can answer the, you know, the ease of it surgically. But you can really do either in, in many cases. If the, if the dural fistula is deep, um, you know, the surgery becomes a little bit more dangerous. If there are lots of, net, if it's a really big network, then it, uh, the surgery can also be a little bit, you know, sometimes we do preoperative embolization and finish it by uh, doing a resection to mitigate um, blood loss during the surgery. Um, but yeah, you can, do you have any other comments? Well, Jay? yeah, I mean, the reality is this, is the, the most important thing is that your team <clears throat> robustly engages with all of the appropriate modalities uh, for treating these lesions. And the truth is surgery works uh, tremendously well. It's a, it's a, frankly, a very quote unquote fun surgery to do. Um, but in the last five years with the development of the dual lumen balloon catheters, the, the type of catheter that Dr. Fifi just showed her treatment of that lesion with, um, it's very uncommon that you can't uh, successfully treat uh, one of these fistulas endovascularly. I would say, you know, there's, there's an occasional ones that, that tie to deep vessels. Uh, there's ones where there's no significant feeder. For instance, the feeders come right off the vert, so it's too dangerous that something might feed back, or they come right off the meningopophyseal trunk, and so that it's too dangerous that you might embolize meaningful arteries like the basilar or the MCA. Um, but that number in the modern era is probably on the order of, I don't know, Joe, what do you think, 20% or 30% at most? Um, yeah. I just did a far lateral for a yeah, at most. I just did a far lateral for a woman uh, with one that came off of her vert, um, and uh, and and you know it went wonderfully. It was a great case and and very satisfying. But if you can have your lesion effectively treated without having to go through the craniotomy, uh, and it can be done in a low risk manner, there is no excuse to do a high risk embolization when you can do a straightforward low risk craniotomy. Um, but, but the reality is, is the significant majority of these can now be treated endovascularly. And uh, I, I think to, to feel otherwise is probably a disservice to the patients. Uh, that, that's my take. Yeah, and I think uh, it, you raise a point you. about, I'm just gonna say you raise a point about the arterial feeders and you can, um, what's a common treatment nowadays, which uh, is, you know, has been common for, for fistulas that are in this location, like in the sigmoid sinus, is to go transvenous. So I showed you a case where I went into the artery and injected onyx, but you can also come through the jugular and into the vein. Um, in this case, you wouldn't really want to go all the way back like that, but if it was a fistula that was somewhere around here, you could come into the vein and, and treat it off that. Yeah, I, we did have a case a few years ago where um, one of our team did do transvenous and something like this, and the patient had a spontaneous hemorrhage. So we took the patient emergently for, for a subdural evacuation and then brought him back a few days later to do a craniotomy for a very deep-seated fistula. Uh, luckily, he's done wonderfully, but that's uh, going transvenous in those small veins can be a little bit precarious yeah. for sure. Yeah. All right, let me see, Joe, if I can grab power because Chris is clearly not coming I'm back. I'm back on. He's I'm back, back on. Back. I'm back. Oh, there he is. You guys can be okay? Yeah, Chris, do you, you want to take over? Yeah, let me take, take over. Stop can you sorry. stop screen sharing and I'll grab it? Here we go. Yeah. We have, we have two. If you guys want to quickly address, address two questions while Chris is moving on. Um, one was, would radio surgery be an option for this lesion? And the other was, um, is there any risk of recurrence when you treat it endovascularly? I'll take a stab. Uh, radio surgery is emerging as a treatment. Ten years ago, no one really believed in it, that it was reasonable. I, my first uh, stop as a career was at University of Florida. Um, the chairman there, a guy by the name of Bill Freeman, 
um, was one of the real founders and developers of Linac uh, radio surgery. Uh, he, he certainly did not believe that it was an appropriate treatment for this. Uh, that said, I've used it now uh, a number of times for lesions that don't have really great other options or you think that they're relatively high risk and you think radio surgery is not particularly dangerous. And it works uh, some of the times. It doesn't work all the time. Um, I have seen a number of cases. The problem is, is many of these are immediately adjacent to a major sinus. And Jonah was talking about if it feeds into the sinus or transverse sinus. And I have seen case, cases presented at meetings where people did radio surgery for those and the whole sinus shut down. Uh, and then the patients ended up getting into trouble. So again, I think radio surgery is a, a reasonable option to consider if you don't have a reasonable low, ask, low risk option with embolization or traditional craniotomy. That would be my take on that. Totally agree. Hey, Jay, the next case is your case. I think this is a good one. I think uh, we should get to it. Sure. Uh, this, is, this is a fun case. This, this case I actually did the day before our last talk. Uh, so I was excited to present it to say I did this yesterday, but now it's like three weeks ago or something. So that is what it is. Uh, this is a 68 year old woman who had an MRI um, for really some unrelated random, you know, shoulder pain and neck pain. Uh, and you can see something there. I'm going to rant. Let's see. What about a uh, uh, Megan? Megan Cosgrove. Can you, do you see anything unusual on that MRI right there? I think you're muted. There you go. Yeah, I see um, something just anterior. Well, to what, the what kind of MRI are we looking at? That's always a good start. So this is an axial T2 weighted MRI. Excellent. And then what do you see unusual on it? So just anterior to the like midbrain region, I guess there's something in the left. Um, I don't know exactly what it is. It looks like it could be another AVM or something. Okay. But you see some sort of filling or flow void right yeah. in the region what's it touching there on the temporal lobe right is that i don't want to get too specific on you but you see the temporal lobe just lateral to it there yeah it might be able to describe it it's touching a region there any ideas there's a couple words you could use for that medial temporal lobe that pokes in there sometimes when it when the icp goes high it pushes mean, like, down on the oncus yeah there you go there you go exactly so it's, it's, it's right in front of the cerebral peduncle on the left, just medial mm -hmm. to the uncus, right? There's some sort of flow void there, okay? So what might you want to get at this point? Um, like an MRA. Okay. Well, how about, what's our next slide? Boom. Not exactly an MRA, but more of an MRI. Uh, and again, you see it. Can you see it on the coronal there? Yeah. So it's on the left side, just inside the uncus, right? Just where you expected. Look, you can see the basilar right there. See that black line going vertical right in the yeah. middle? Uh, so you can see it's a little bit far off of that. But I think you were, you were spot on with, um, with your assessment. I'm sorry, one second. Uh, this is about a patient. Um, I'm sorry. I, this is this is one of our residents in house right now. Okay. Uh, all right. I'll get through this real quick. So, anyways, um, so you get vascular imaging. MRA is a great choice. I think we went to angio next, and so here's an angio. So you're going to see a 3D picture here, right? And uh, I'll, I'll give you one last question, Megan. What, what do you think? Do you see anything there? This is an odd one, so don't feel upset if you don't get it. What do you think you see there? Chris, point out the basilar for her. This is the basilar right here. Mm. This is one of the PCAs coming out. Oh, okay. It's a tricky orientation because it's very cut in. All right. Any, be, anything? Could it be an, an yeah, aneurysm? 
It could be an aneurysm. Plus, when I'm the one asking the question, that's a good guess. <laughs> that's right. And can you guess what artery it's off of? Uh, PCOM? Mm, close. What artery comes off of the basilar right below the posterior cerebral artery? Here, I'll, I'm going to take you off the hot seat, Megan. It's not fair. I've given you too many questions. How about oh, the superior cerebral right. artery? Oh, look at you. You got it in even when I tried to move on. Good job. That's right. That's right. Megan, that's superior cerebellar artery, SCA. So uh, that's exactly what, oh, go back. You're giving away all the answers, Chris. Uh, see, that's Chris trying to be the nice guy. I usually play bad cop. He plays good cop. Um, you can see there the SCA. You can see this big aneurysm that's really a fusiform blowout of the whole thing. You can also see we put the measurements here. Okay. You can see we put the measurements here. Uh, and the artery measures about one millimeter. And the reason why that's important is that we don't have stents that are approved for arteries that are one millimeter or less in size. If you try to put coils into this aneurysm, they won't, there's nothing to hold them into the sac. And so they'll block the artery. You might get away with it. In this case, to be honest, um, because it's such a dysplastic fusiform segment, uh, but you very well might not. And when it's my brainstem, I don't want you to roll the dice on whether you may or may not get away with it. And so this is a case where even though we don't do a lot of posterior circulation aneurysm surgery anymore, this is a case where that was clearly the best choice. And so uh, three weeks ago, we took this lady for a craniotomy to clip her aneurysm. Next slide, Chris. So this highlights the way I like to approach these. Um, you'll see lots of discussions about transylvian, lateral carotid triangle, medial carotid triangle, optical carotid, various approaches. I, I, tend, I do a very small, we actually, I don't think we have a picture of it, but I do a small craniotomy that's underneath the muscle below the superior temporal line, but exposes the sphenoid wing for typical carotid access but then also comes back over the root of the zygoma so you can also have middle fossa access. Uh, because it's my experience, and now I've done a, a good number of these, that when you're clipping aneurysms at the basilar apex, uh, I much prefer to approach them from the lateral, from middle fossa transtentorial approach. When you're looking at the entire basilar complex, and we'll show this to you in a second, you're looking, you can see behind quite easily and you can see the perforators and protect them. Whereas when you're coming transylvian, lateral carotid, optical carotid, you really can't see that. The other issue is if you go back to the angiogram real quick, Chris, please. Um, when you're approaching, we're looking at this at AP and I don't know if you can see my hands, but if you're coming at the aneurysm AP, imagine yourself reaching onto that and trying to clip it. You'll see that your clips are scrunching the vessel from one end of normal vessel to another other together. That's not gonna work, right? What you wanna do is you wanna reconstruct this vessel in any aneurysm, MCA, carotid, whatever it is. You want your clips to come in the orientation of the parent vessels so that you cinch it up and you create more normal anatomy. It's a little hard to share that in a webinar, but uh, hopefully one day you guys will get a chance to see. But you really wanna, if you have a big capacious aneurysm and the vessels are going this way, you want your clip to go this way along the course of the aneurysm. If you come this way, you're gonna have all this redundant tissue and you risk also kinking the parent artery. So again, that's why I like approaching it from the side. So go back to the pictures. So what we did is we did this small anterior transylvian approach, open, get the carotid exposed, free up everything and take some CSF off because that makes it very easy to allow the temporal lobe to fall away. Next slide. Uh, and now you'll see that we're, we're going to, this is still the sylvian. So we've exposed the carotid artery. That's the MCA. Chris, I don't know if you can point. You'll see the carotid artery coming down and you'll see the MCA coming up towards us, up in the screen. That's the MCA right there. See that? Okay, next slide. And now we come to middle fossa. So from the same craniotomy that's not more than about this big, you come over inferior temporal lobe, you've taken a bunch of CSF off, next slide, and you slowly work underneath the temporal lobe till you get to where the tentorium comes off the skull base and starts to come up towards the incisura. And then you cauterize that and you cut through it. And then you can just cut straight through the tentorium 
And that's going to reveal, depending on the patient's anatomy, from about the top third of the basilar to the top 50% of the basilar. Next slide. But when you're doing that, you have to be very cautious because running right underneath the tentorium and then going into the incisura before leaving the skull is an important structure, which this picture shows. Chris, can you point out the structure that I'm going to ask someone? I'm going to ask, I hope I say this right, Shail Meta? Shail, are you there? No? All right, I guess not. How about find someone else here? How about um, David Para? David, you with us? Am I frozen? Can you guys hear me? I think you're looking. Yes. Oh, there we uh, go. These these guys call in and then uh, and then just leave. So that Wait, they, is that the panelist list or the attendee list? Maybe they can't talk. No, uh, I think it's panelists. Panelists. Okay, okay. The panelist list. How about hey, put a put a mark next to those names. I'm messing, guys. I'm messing. <laughs> yeah. Para, David, are you available now? I thought I saw the mute go away. How about Anch Goyle? Anch, you there? Uh, yes, sir, I'm here. Oh, fantastic. All right, so we've cut the tentorium. Mm -hmm. We're looking at the brainstem below us, the temporal lobes lifted up. What white structure is that running across the field that goes into the incisura as it moves forward? Any guesses? Uh, I'm struggling to orient myself a little bit. Um, so is that the temporal lobe that's the, so the, the, the suture there, that's um, the temporal? No, that's on the, no, that's, a, yeah, that's on the, that's on the dura. Okay. And so inferior is at the top of the screen. Okay. Superior is in the bottom right. The temporal lobe is what's being lifted to the down right direction. I see. And so let's cut the 10. I know it's very tricky of us to do this to you on a two dimensional picture. So that's not very fair, but I'll tell you what, it's a white banded structure. Uh -huh. So, so what white, what are white structures in this area? Um, I'm not sure. It could be some sort of a ligament. Okay. That's a, that's a, that's a, that's a reasonable guess. All right. Let's try another one. How about, um, I'm just going to keep moving around here. How about uh, Clementine? Clementine, what do you think that white structure is? Um, my best guess would be the trochlea nerve. That's right. That's exactly right. So your fourth cranial nerve comes around the brainstem, runs under the tent, and then tucks into the incisure, which you can see right at the front of that picture. And so that's what you have to look for whenever you're doing a transtentorial approach. You want to make sure you don't cut that. Otherwise, the person will walk around forever with their head tilted, right? Anyone know what that's called? Yasmin, you know what that's called when they get a fourth nerve injury? Um, I'm drawing a blank on the name, but um, yeah, I'm drawing a blank on the name, but I know what you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> All right, that's okay. Don't worry. We're not taking notes and we're not going to remember. We're just here to try to help you guys learn things. Okay. Uh, anyone else have any guess? That'd be torticollis. Uh, no, not exactly. Not exactly. Reasonable shot. Anyone else? All right. Well, that'll be good homework. So next slide. So as soon as we do that, you can see the in incised tent behind. You can see we've come down right on the aneurysm. The, the tentorium is now relaxed. You see how it's very floppy and loose. Chris, would you point out the tentorium? Right, and see how it's floppy right on the edge there? It's not a tight band pushing back. That's why we cut it. And then you're gonna see a big round structure and that's this ugly aneurysm. Can you show, show them the aneurysm there, Chris? You guys see that right there? So you can see it's a great approach because you're looking right at it. Right, and then the aneurysm is pushing on another important nerve. Uh, let me go back. Let me go back to Sean because I only gave you one question before. Sean, line. 
Any ideas what that uh, other nerve is that's much bigger that the aneurysm is pushing on and is heading just lateral to the carotid you can see there? Um, well, I mean, I've kind of just gone off of the geometry of the superior cerebellar, cerebellar artery and I know that it's close to three and four. Um, so I'd be tempted to say three, but I don't know the course of that, whether that runs lateral to the carotid. Yeah, that's three. That's exactly right. And because it runs lateral, you can see there uh, how it runs lateral to the carotid. That's why PCOM aneurysms that stick out laterally when they expand or rupture often cause third nerve palsies because they're pushing laterally right on that nerve. Okay. So you have an aneurysm here. It's nice and sizable. It's in the posterior circulation. And you can see it's straddled right in between the fourth cranial nerve and the third cranial nerve. Um, so it's, it, it's, I mean, this is why vascular is so awesome. And anatomy is just amazing. It's so much fun. All right, so next slide. So this is just dissecting it free. And you're going to see there's going to end up being perforators in the back. That is a great shot. Chris, would you show them the uh, PCOM coming off? There's the carotid. There's the PCOM. See that? So you can imagine if there was an aneurysm poking off of that, it would stick right into the third nerve. Show them the third nerve. Boom, right there. See that? So if this aneurysm wasn't there, that PCOM would be going right into it, right? You can't miss it. It's right there. Okay, next slide. Okay, good. So now you can see we've dissected the whole thing open. We've already put, we've already put one clip on there. Um, but you can see the clip is able to come exactly along the direction of the blood vessels of the aneurysm. Now, this, in this kind of a case with this type of a corridor with all these critical structures and perforators around it, you can't just get a perfect clipping right away. It's great to take a big fenestrated clip and kind of cinch the whole thing down right in the middle. And then that's going to allow you to look around it and make sure you've got all the perforators off before you put the rest of your clip construct on. Next slide. And so this is what we ended up. We had that first clip cinching it. And then we took two fenestrated angled clips to finish the rest of the neck and reconstruct it. And you can see there's a little perforators. Chris, can you show the little perforators coming off in the backside, uh, right in between the bayonet? Yeah, those are little brainstem perforators. If you catch those, the patient will be paralyzed afterwards. So having this lateral view where you can look behind, in my mind, is, is really advantageous. Next slide. I think, do we have the ICG? Great. So here's the ICG. And you can see the aneurysm is completely obliterated. You can see the SCA fills exactly perfect. And I'm going to lift it up, and you're going to be able to see those little perforators all open and not occluded posteriorly, which is critical. All right. I love ICG, by the way. It's completely, like, changed my life. It's, it's made – it's greatly decreased our need for intraoperative angiography. Next slide. Honestly, it was hard to tell where the inflow and outflow was from the other pictures, but on this oh, one, yeah, maybe you, can show you, get, it, Chris. you get a sense that this is the outflow and the inflow is over here and you're not able to see it, right? I, I no, I, right below, right below, Chris, right underneath third nerve. See the basilar oh, there coming yeah, there up? Yeah. There's right the inflow. There's the third nerve, that black thing going up. <clears throat> that's the basilar coming up. As it goes above, that's the PCA. I'm pointing, but you can't see where I'm pointing. I'm sorry, guys. I'm trying to point where you're PCA. pointing. Yeah, exactly. Uh, but that really shows the apex of the basilar. Yeah. So this is the basilar. This is the top of the basilar. And then this yeah. is the SCA coming down like that. So you reconstructed right here. Yep. And all the clips are over on the aneurysm. Cool. Correct. And you, and you can see how the third nerve comes off right in between the PCA and the SCA, right? Yeah. Here's the PCA. Pretty here's the nice. You can also see the PCOM. See the PCOM going to the PCA? Yeah. Yep, right there. Right see there. that little jig in the PCOM? And then there's the carotid up above. So you can see half the circle of Willis here. Pretty awesome. neat. Awesome. Love this stuff. All right. More importantly, this is her the next morning. You can see we do it from a very small shave just above the severe temporal line to a little question mark to the ear. And, uh, and she did wonderful. And she, um, gave actually, she, was, us, she gave permission and asked that we show this picture, actually. So. Yeah, she, she wanted to brag. Uh, and I don't know which resident took it, but he has a very artistic flair with the breakfast there. It's, <laughs> it's a very neat kind of angle for the picture. But anyway, so um, basically, this is a little summary of the literature that you, you should know. Chris, you want to talk about this a little bit? Yeah, sure. Uh, you know, basically, there is a randomized study called Ishua. 
and there are observation there are observational studies and one major observational study is UCAPS that came out of Japan and so whenever you're talking about aneurysm rupture risk you want to know what the numbers are from these studies that let you know this patient with an aneurysm this size in this location so you need to know the size and location of the aneurysm and then you can get the rupture risk for that patient and you use that to decide whether or not you're going to operate or treat that aneurysm and generally speaking, seven millimeters is a good number, but of course you want to look at the exact, what the data shows. And so you can either memorize the tables as Jay has done, or you can use an app like I do. No app, skip this slide. No app allowed. So if you want to download an app that gives you rupture risk before you memorize the table, I would download this one. But if you want to memorize the table, I would memorize this one. This is what you need to know. <laughs> there, you're not allowed to open an app when you're taking the oral boards. And so if I'm examining you and you say that you do vascular neurosurgery and you don't know this table, you're not going to pass your boards. That's, just, um, that's a free hint. That's a fair, you're, you're guaranteed. All right. So this is one you need to know. It's very easy. Uh, the aneurysm gods were kind because you can see the numbers essentially completely copy each other, just shift over by one uh, category. Um, the issue of study, International Study of Unrefrigerated Intracranial Aneurysms was run out of the Mayo Clinic. Um, it has some very interesting issues. There are some problems with it. Uh, I'm on the writing group. The last three papers that have come out, I've, I've uh, done the analysis and, and authored. Uh, but it doesn't change the fact that it's not completely perfect uh, because it was a study of aneurysms that were registered with them. It wasn't a complete 100% enrollment, right? So the right way to do this would be to say, we're never gonna treat any aneurysms, we're gonna watch them all and find out. But we can't do that ethically. So instead what we did is we had doctors register aneurysms with us. And so if the doctors are good at picking which ones need to be treated versus which ones don't, then our numbers might be an underestimation. There's also some issues with the methodology. This was before we had digital angiograms. So they were true cut film subtractions for many of them. And so we had to use normal anatomic variants of head sizes to make measurements and things but it's still important data that you must discuss with any patient that you're, you're uh, having conversation with. And essentially you're looking at two and a half percent over five years for seven to 12 with the anterior circulation, which goes up to 14 and a half, which goes up to 40. And if you go to the posterior circulation or PCOM, all you do is shift that down two and a half percent for less than seven, 14 and a half for seven to 12, 18 for 13 to 24, and then 50% for, for giant aneurysms. So it's a pretty easy table to remember. I'd highly recommend you learn it. It's on, it's about the fourth page of the issue with second publication, which was in Lancet in I think 2001. Okay. We have a few Senator minutes Chris. left. Chris, do you want to try and finish up your, your case? Yeah. Um, you know, let's go back to that. Um, so we had gotten to the point where this patient uh, was in the operating room and he had a thrombectomy. We stented the carotid so that we could reach the MCA occlusion. Remember we saw the occlusion in the M1? By the time we got in there, this patient had gotten TPA and the occlusion had moved. And so now we can see some M2 branches. We can even see another branch. And then we start to see where it looks like the flow is not getting through and there's something blocking there. We can very clearly see the actual clot right there. So you can see I'm already snaking up. I've got my intermediate catheter here and I'm already snaking up a wire and a microcatheter to get out, uh, an intermediate catheter to get out to this clot. And then when you compare this image on the right and this one on the left, you can see that right here is where the occlusion was and now it has been recanalized. And so this guy did well. He, at three months later, was independent in his daily activities, um, and he had mild expressive aphasia. But let's pretend for a second that instead of coming in one hour after, he came in, he woke up, and he was found like this when he woke up. And so now we don't know exactly when his stroke started. And now when we look at his CT, we actually start to see a little bit of hyperdensity here. A hypodensity, sorry, and we're, we're able to see that maybe there's some of the stroke has occurred and some of the tissue is already damaged. Now we need to make a decision. Are we going to do that same procedure or has too much tissue been damaged to shift the risk benefit away from the procedure and towards medical management? And so I mentioned, I referenced this scale a little bit earlier called the ASPECTS score. And this is a score where every time 
you see hypo density in a spot, you give that you give that spot a point, and you count up all the points you count, and ten is the maximum score. So if a patient has a ten, that's perfect. Sorry, for every hypo dense area, they lose a point. Um, and so we saw that it looked like this patient had lost just one point in this spot. So we'll give him a nine. So we'll still take him uh, to the procedure. And uh, after we do, sorry, after we do the CT and we get the aspect score, we do what's called the CT perfusion. And the CT perfusion has been proven to help make decisions uh, in some trials that came out after the original thrombectomy trials. And here, there are really two kinds of images. There's a cerebral blood flow set of images, and there's a cerebral blood volume set of images. And so when the cerebral blood flow is low and the cerebral blood volume is high, that means that there's a mismatch ratio. And when there's a mismatch ratio, that means that there's tissue to save. Um, so that lets us know that we can move forward with this procedure, we can treat this patient. Um, and here are some basic guidelines for what we would treat. We want to see that the core volume of the stroke is less than 70 milliliters. And we want to see that the mismatch ratio is less than 1.8. Okay. So those are kind of general rules that one of the trials used. And in uh, the trial called the Dawn trial was positive. So that's, those are the numbers that we use, although we, you can, if, if it's a few points over, you know, you'll make a clinical decision. And so here are all the stroke trials that came out in 2015, 16, 17, um, that help guide our management today. So it's been really an inspiring few years to see all these trials uh, come out and, and guide what we do. Um, and even we've got some trials now to help us decide what kind of removal we can do. Not only is it a good idea before six hours and also a good idea for some patients between six and 24 hours, but we also now know that suction is as good as if you use a stent retriever on your first pass. So I'll stop there for questions on ischemic stroke. And we might even have time to talk about another case, or we could talk about career-related questions. Peter, what's our time looking like? Nope, not time for another case. Yeah, I think probably not no. tonight. Ooh. Any other questions from the group? Hey, you guys got two hours. Everyone else got one. <laughs> Anyone, any thoughts, any last questions? I wanted to ask Dr. Fifi if the patient who was having the odd smells, if that was, if that remained after his treatment for the fistula. He actually stopped having the odd smells, but we can never uh, prove his EEG was, was negative and we could not, um, he, we didn't actually put him on seizure medications and they just stopped. So. Uh, you know, it, it, we think it's related to the, the fistula, but um, you know, couldn't prove it. But it did go away. Ischemic migraine aura. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Or mass effect from the fistula. Mm -hmm. Some irritation probably, but... Yeah, I mean, that, that vein would have pulsatile arterial blood running along the medial temporal lobe. Yeah. I'd like to know what Dr. Fifi's favorite case is. What's your favorite case to do? <laughs> What's my favorite case to do? Hmm. I don't know. How, it's hard to choose. Like stroke is so much fun. Patients get, get better in front of your eyes. Um, the uh, aneurysms are cool. We use a lot of new technologies. Um, you know, every, every year or something new comes out, flow diverters, um, intrasacular flow diverters. And uh, I like dural fistulas for the complexity of it sometimes and the challenges that you run into. So let's say it's hard to choose. <laughs> Mine is There's definitely ICH evacuation. Okay, what, what's your... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> There was yeah, one question about, oh, sorry, Jay, you and I answered that one. No, it's okay. What's the question? That's more important. Uh, there's one question as to whether uh, aspects is used outside of the MCA territory. Um, good question. Um, 
it is not approved for outside the uh, MCA territory. Um, however, for ACA um, occlusions, we do still use it. Um, and for the posterior circulation, it, it doesn't really make a lot of sense uh, to use it for the posterior circulation because you're more interested in what the brainstem looks like in the, in the cerebellum. So um, good question, uh, mostly for the MCA circulation. I would throw out that it's a semi-quantitative scale. It's a little, even, you know, it was developed in Calgary. And even when you talk with those guys, they, um, you know, they, they kind of look at it. They, they don't like tally up each exact number. They say, yeah, it's about a seven. Oh, it's about a nine. You know, it's, it's, um, it's a framework to guide us thinking about what we think is the, the next best step. And then there was one more. Someone else had one. What did, I think I saw one pop up there. Yes. There's so, one, one question about, about CEA, I think. Let yes. Um, yes. So this is Clementine here. I have a question that I didn't get to ask in the last session that we had, and um, I haven't been able to find the 